This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. He's Greg, I'm Nick. You know the deal. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. And do us a favor. If you like the podcast, want to support the podcast, go over to Prize Picks. Sign up using that code CLNS. It will help us tremendously. Greg, let's take a look at some of these visits over the past couple of days. We'll start with J.J. McCarthy. He visited Gillette yesterday. Uh, My question to you is what questions would you have for J.J. during these sit-downs? Good question. Um, I would want to throw him a bunch of curveballs, sort of you know, get him – uh, on his toes, um, all these guys with their agents and stuff like that, they're all prepared for these things. And, and really, <clears throat> and this sort of goes to the column that I wrote um, on Sunday about, um, you know, background of the quarterback evaluation process with somebody who's been through it multiple times with multiple teams. And, you know, really it's about, <clears throat> it's not so much the specific questions, it's more about the length of the meetings and how much work you're doing with them and putting them in different situations. And you want to see, you want to see stamina. You want to see them, you know, get through the rehearsed answers that they've gone over with their agents. And you just want to dial into like, you know, who is this guy? Do I want to be in a quarterback room with him? Is this somebody that I could see myself working with? But, you know, specific to JJ, excuse me, I would want to know more about the Michigan offense and, why he wasn't put in in certain situations, um, like, you know, having to carry the team or, you know, some some third downs when he's being asked to run instead of pass and and just his general feelings on that. I mean, to me, and also, you know, what he would think about um, going to a completely different situation than a really good college football team that had been building to become national champions, a really good defense, uh, not really – put behind often, you know, how, how would he feel about having to come to be the the face of a franchise and, and having to really ignite the offense without a whole lot of stuff around him? I mean, I'm sure he'd have normal answers, but those are some of my lingering questions about JJ McCarthy. When I think of McCarthy, Greg, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but what I've read and, and what people have said about him, I would imagine he'd pass something like yesterday with flying colors, right? Because he's the intangibles yeah. guy. We, we we should all expect that McCarthy did a very good job during this visit. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I would I would think so. I mean, again, I think it's it's more about and and it depends on how the Patriots run their visits. Every team does it differently. You know, one one team. Uh, did it like a recruiting visit, like, you know, um, took him out to, uh, a fancy place for dinner, which the Patriots do at, you know, Davio's, but it's more about like trying to show them all that they have instead of, you know, another team basically puts them through like a rookie mini camp where it's, you know, they'll get out there with some of the coaches and, and, you know, maybe some of the personnel and like, we're going to run through some plays and some people are going to mess up on purpose. Like, how does he react to that? Like, those are all the things that I want to see. Uh, on a visit and mostly like the the stamina like you know how how are they going to do with a full day like this isn't college where you're limited by the amount of time I mean when you're a National Football League player especially a quarterback it's 6 7 a.m to 10 11 12 o'clock at night it's it's a complete sea change yeah I don't get the whole recruiting idea like because this isn't free agency I, I don't quite understand approaching it like that but I did want to ask you how do you think the Patriots have handled these visits? Maybe you know how they've handled these visits. With Elliot Wolf on top of the program right now, do you think they put him through a full day of teaching? I would say that they would be somewhere in between those two sort of teams that I talked about. I think that I think it would I think it will be a really long day. Um, I think there will be a lot of meetings. I think there will be a lot of meetings with Alex Van Pelt with Ben McAdoo, uh, T.T. McCartney, uh, Mayo, of course, they'll meet ownership. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, I think basically, I don't know exactly how this new regime does things, but I think that 
um, they are going to try to get them in front of a lot of different people. And then people are going to compare notes at the end of the day and find out, you know, exactly what this what this person is made out of. All right. Right now, it's April 16th. We're nine days away from the draft. I want Greg Bedard's thoughts on this, whether you want to let us know if you've heard something or not. But right now, today, more likely or less likely that McCarthy is a Patriot compared to how you felt last week? Um, I would probably say less likely. And this isn't based off of any intel or anything like that. Um, trust me when I say that, um, you know, there's a lot of closed mouths around Foxborough. And I think this is by design. And this is something we'll get into with um, sort of a surprise visit that the Patriots have going on uh, right now with another quarterback. Um, you know, I, I just think, I think the Patriots, th- this is my overall comment on all of this stuff and everything that's going on. And this is basically what I told you at the outset. Elliot Wolf is going to keep all options on the table. You yeah. are not going to be able to read into anything. You know, this stuff about him pushing for J.J. McCarthy. <laughs> that's not even close to the Elliot Wolf that I know. And so basically, like, I think Elliot is going to come out of this. I think he's hopeful that nobody has any idea what the Patriots are going to do. And I don't think that they have, I don't think they have any idea today, exactly an idea of what they're going to do, but I think they are leaving all options on the table and what they are doing, the way they're doing it to me, you know, uh, you could easily say it's indicative of them taking a quarterback at three, but also indicative of them trying to get somebody to offer the bag where you get into a scenario. And I don't rule this out at all where the Patriots trade down with some sort of Godfather offer. And then they trade back up um, and maybe hopefully pick up a extra first round pick in the process. Like say they went down to, um, you know, 11 with the Vikings, say the Vikings chalk up, you know, offer up what they, what the Patriots want, what they would move for. So they move back to 11, but all of a sudden they move back to six with, you know, say the giants or somebody like that. And they're able to get the quarterback that they really want. And, but also pick up a late first round pick where they can get an offensive tackle or a wide receiver or whatever. Like I think, I'm telling, I think all options are on the table and I think it's going to be that way for a while. If you want more details about what Greg just said, I actually wrote a column at BSJ a couple of weeks ago. Greg's talking about the Patriots going the full Monty, Monty Austin yep. for it, and what he did with the Arizona Cardinals. That's my second favorite option right now, Greg, by the way, as we sit yep. here. My, my favorite option is you love a quarterback, you take the quarterback at three. I love the idea, and people can check out the column. I also did a podcast on it with, with more details involving picks with the Rich Hill trade chart. I love the idea of moving down and then moving back up because I think you can add draft capital and still land one of those blue chip offensive prospects, even if it's not quarterback. I mean, you if you move back up to six, you could end up with Joe Alt, yep. a, a franchise left tackle, and you still have 23 from Minnesota that you now could spend on a wide receiver, so on and so forth, with, with even more extra capital that you got in that deal. So, that's my second favorite option is going the full Monty. Let's talk about Michael Penix. I think this is what you were talking about just a couple minutes ago, this kind of under-the-radar last-minute meeting. This is the first contact, Greg, reported uh, by the by the top decision-makers Okay, since the combine. We, we know Cam Williams was out there in Washington during Drake May's pro day. The Patriots did send Cam out there along with, I think, three or four scouts was the reporting back then. Uh, we obviously know they have a link on this coaching staff from Washington, uh, somebody that was you know on the staff last year. But do you think it's meaningful? Do you think it's meaningful this full th- this first contact since the combine between Penix and guys like Mayo and Elliott Wolf so late in this process? Yeah, I think so. And like you know, one of the things that we won't know is, say for example, um, and this is allowed, um, you know, are the are the Patriots set to say go out to Washington or Penix's hometown like next week to put him through a workout? Even though yeah. you know some people differ on 
whether you even need to put a put a workout on. Like, well, we know like the Vikings, and there was another team, maybe Washington, somebody, not Washington, um, of oh, the Falcons, um, went to Penix and put them through like full workouts. Um, not every team believes you have to do that. A lot of teams believe it's just the film that you see and the meeting time. And you, you, what this tells me is that they're at least, and this could be a smoke screen. It could just be to throw everybody off and keep them guessing about what exactly the Patriots are going to do. Um, but they're at least putting Penix on par with Daniels, May, and McCarthy in terms of when you're selecting a franchise quarterback, what you really want to do at the end of the day is you want to sort of have equal time or equal equal information on each guy. And then you can sort of stack them. You can put them up and you, can, and you ask them the same questions. You run them through the same plays. What's their recall? Do they understand our playbook? Like, you know, all that stuff. So at least – Penix, and especially if the Patriots go out and work them out, or maybe they already have, and maybe it's a sort of secret clandestine thing, which happens all the time this time of year. I think you you have to finish 30 visits, I think, by tomorrow, and then you can do workouts through the 24th. So a lot of stuff can still go on underneath the radar. So, But at the very least, I think they are putting Penix on the comparison board for their option at quarterback. Yeah, and Penix, if people are wondering, he visited Denver. He visited Vegas. Uh, he was put through a Minnesota workout, one of those private workouts. The Giants also spent time with Penix, which begs the question. You look at these teams, Greg, Denver, Vegas, Minnesota, the Giants. There are a lot of scenarios as to why Michael Penix might be visiting so late. Is one of them the Patriots possibly preparing for a deal to move on down? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's possible. Um, some of those conversations could be, could be taking place right now. I think it's more likely they're taking place next week. And, and, you know, if you, um, sorry, I'm just going to call up the draft order, but one of the, one of the things that, um, you can, you can do is, um, you know, you can have, you know, a pre-arrangement, like say the, the Patriots are, entertaining trading down but yeah. then you get the secondary deal that says you know we're going to trade up back into this spot and like you know like they the patriots could trade out of three maybe think they're going to pick something up but they could even trade back into four with monty austin fort who is of course you know extremely extremely well known to them um ortiz with the chargers um, he used to be in Baltimore. There's a lot of familiarity. Of course, the Giants, Dayball used to be with the Patriots. Um, you know, so there are a lot of different scenarios where, you know, you're working on two deals at the same time. We're working on our trade down, but we're working on our trade back up. It's all interesting. I think another scenario is that the Patriots could be trying to build value at other spots in the draft. And what I mean by that is, you know, if if you move down to 11, well, now you might be in Penix territory depending on who you believe. Ian Rappaport came out a couple weeks ago and said that Penix is most likely a first-round pick. He thinks likely in the top 16. So if you move back to, you know, if you're looking at 11, maybe a team wants to move up to 11 to pick Penix, and now you can try to sell to that team that, hey, we have interest in Penix. If you want us to move mm -hmm. out of this spot, you better really make it worthwhile. You can do the same yep. thing at 23 if you pull that deal off with Minnesota for 11 and 23. Shoot, Greg, you can even do it at 34. I mean, if Penix doesn't go in the first round and he continues to slide and you're sitting there at 34, now you've had a visit with him to make other teams believe that you are into this guy. And it's going to take more for you to move out of that spot because, man, oh, man, look, maybe we weren't so sold on Michael before the visit, but he blew our shorts off during that visit. And if you want the 34th pick, you better pay up. I think there's a lot of different and, and, scenarios. Yeah, and one thing also to keep in mind, um, remember, so 34 will be the second pick in the second round, and that's the second day. So yep. often what happens is teams get done. They go back and look at their board. They're like, geez, I can't believe this guy's here. And it could not necessarily – it could be an offensive tackle. It could be a wide receiver in this draft. And the Patriots, it's very similar position um, – which was one of my big head scratchers when the Patriots had 33, the first pick of the second round, 
They got offered a trade. They decided to pass on the trade and took Ross I. Dowling. Um, so it's, it's a very similar situation where teams kind of get horny after the first round, especially teams maybe who haven't picked or haven't picked in a while. They all of a sudden go back and they talk about it and they see a certain player on the board and they start getting horny. And now the Patriots will be in a better position to be informed. One last thing, and I dove deeper into this during my pod today when I talked about the Penix visit, is this idea of if if you do have, as as Greg said, you could have multiple deals on the table, and, and a lot of times you do, and, and you're kind of playing one deal off of another deal. The other possibility here is that, you know, you could be having this visit with Penix to try to sell other teams outside of Minnesota that you have a deal in place with Minnesota. Because if other teams think, oh, wait a minute, that – they have Penix visiting. Maybe they're going to draft Penix at 11 and 23. So, for example, if you're trying to sell the Giants and the Giants have reportedly wanted a quarterback, John Mara came out and said that he's given the front office the green light to you know go after a quarterback if that's what they think is what's in the best interest of the football team. Brian Dayball, let's say, loves Drake May because he reminds him of Josh Allen or something, right? And the Giants want to move up to six. Well, the Patriots... They could say, look, we have a great deal on the table with Minnesota. The Giants, if they're trying to call the Patriots bluff, you have Penix in for a visit, so you make it look like you're on the precipice of dealing out of three, and you're going to be sitting at 11-23 and 23, where you can draft Penix to try to put pressure on the Giants because now the Giants look at it and go, wait a minute, they have Penix in for a visit. Maybe that Minnesota talk is legitimate, and maybe you get the Giants to up their offer, and now you move only back to six. So you don't have to worry about moving down and then back up. There's just a million different possibilities, folks, is the point. And we don't know. Nobody knows why Penix is in town. It could be legit interest by the Patriots. It could be gamesmanship. With all that said, Greg, where would you rank Penix right now? We have the list of six guys, right? We've got the Caleb Williams, May, Daniels. You've got McCarthy. You've got Penix. You've got Knicks. Where do you put Penix? So I've changed my rankings ever so slightly. So obviously Caleb Williams is number one. Um, Drake may is now two a for me. And I would put Jaden Daniels as two B mm. for me. Um, I would be fine with either of those guys for the Patriots at three. Um, I do have JJ McCarthy fourth and Michael Penix fifth. Um, I would put where I would draft Michael Penix. I would say anywhere from 12 and down, I would be comfortable. I, I just think he throws the crap out of the ball and I'll deal with everything else. I'm not that scared of the, the injury thing. I just, um, like I, I, I need to come out of this draft with a quarterback. He might not be the long-term long-term for this franchise, but he's pretty freaking good. And he has a chance to be, uh, outstanding. His, his, his passing is, is next level. And that's it for as far as possible starter for this team at any point that's the end of my list I'm not doing Bo Nix I'm not doing Spencer Rattler I'm not doing any of these guys like that that is my list for the Patriots and guys that I would be um at least somewhat happy with I'm not huge on McCarthy but um I do see the value in him at least Getting the program going. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less in two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball and hockey's postseason, which is coming up. I can't wait. I know Nick is going to be freaking <laughs> geeked up for all that stuff. That's for sure. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 with basketball, hockey, baseball entries today on prize pick, America's number one fantasy sports app. This week on prize picks, I'm selecting Jalen Brown for more than 25 points, David Posternock for two goals or more, Tyler O'Neill, the big thumper, for two-plus home runs this week. And Kenley Jansen for two saves. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. 
pick more, pick less. It's that easy at Prize Picks. Before we get to some wide receiver talk, Greg, I've got one more question for you regarding visits. I don't know if you saw this today, but I believe it was your buddy Burt Breer with the report that Washington's bringing like all the quarterbacks in. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like the, they're bringing everybody in for like one night. This is this is like I saw Andrew Callahan quote tweet it say it's like the Bachelor of quarterbacks in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I know people will say, well, that'll give the owner a chance to meet all of these guys in one shot. But what do you make of that approach by the commanders? Yeah, it's fascinating. I've never really heard of it before. Part of me is part of me is surprised that, first of all, that the schedule worked out that way. And secondly, that all of the agents agreed to it. Um yeah, I don't know. It's like speed dating. It's like, you know, I I don't know. This is fascinating. I hope somebody gets the story <laughs> about how this all worked because I, I will be fascinated to hear, like, you know, was it just like that they have them on a clock and they had to go to like, you know, they each switch rooms like, you know, for after like an hour or like, you know, I, I don't know. It's um to me, it might be, you know, somewhat or, uh, owner oriented. You never know with these rich guys when they're available and, and the newer owners always stick their nose in more than they should. So, um, yeah, but definitely interesting. It just goes back to what you mentioned though. You know, some teams want to put these guys through the ringer for a full day. You can't put everybody through the ringer for a full day if you got them all in at once. So mm -hmm. it, it, it is a very interesting approach. All right. Let's do some, uh, some lightning round wide receiver updates before we get to your column on the process of selecting a quarterback, which I loved, by the way, that came out over the weekend. Uh, a lot of wide receiver news over the past couple of days with with these, you know, these what would you call them? Um, camps. They're not camps. They're voluntary, right? Voluntary, yeah, voluntary workouts, voluntary workouts. There we go, Nick. All right. So let's start with Philadelphia. Devontae Smith gets the bag from the Eagles. Could this make A.J. Brown available? Uh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, whether that happens, it's, it's always tough to tell with the Eagles and, um, because they're, they are wizards at the cap and how they, they work things. Howie Roseman is among the best in the league. Um, you know, I just know that they're going to have to do something if they keep AJ Brown, they are going to need to do something to his contract. Can they do that? Um, I don't know. But uh, I'm hoping that at the end of the draft and all this stuff, I'm hoping that, you know, whether it's A.J. Brown or uh, Ayuk or Cortland Sutton, like all these guys are available and the Patriots can sort of check that off on something that has driven people crazy uh, who certainly lack patience and in their inability to, at this point, uh, nab a wide receiver one. An interesting part of this is not a lot of people likely paying attention to this in, in New England, but... The Eagles, their salary cap executive actually is leaving, and yes. his name is Jake mm -hmm. Rosenberg. He'd been with the Eagles for 12 years, so he was their contract management guy. That came out in late March, so about three weeks ago. So it, it'll be kind of interesting to see how they handle these contract negotiations and, and some of the games and stuff that Greg mentions without Rosenberg. How much of a pivotal piece was he to the operation? We'll probably find out. Cortland Sutton. Yep. Cortland Sutton is going to be holding out. Are, are you still on Cortland watch? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, wh whether that happens, I do think a lot of these teams, Nick, I think because these drafts have become so receiver rich, I do think a lot of them are, they're not in a hurry and they want to see which way the, the, the draft shakes out. And even, you know, when they, when they come in for a rookie mini camp or even in the mandatory mini camp or even the early stages of the training camp, they want to see what they have and then sort of go from there and see which guys like, okay, Cortland wants X, Y, and Z. Well, we just drafted this kid and look at him. He's, he, you know, I can see him in six games being better than Cortland. So why don't we get rid of Cortland? So uh, a lot of things are in flux. I want to go back to AJ Brown. Cause I got another question for Cortland. What would you be willing to give up for AJ Brown? 
Uh, AJ Brown, another benefit, Nick, also to waiting until after the draft about wide receiver one is now you're getting into future picks. Yep. Um, and, and I really want to use where the Patriots are, um, with their picks, with their high picks, um, in each round. I really want to use these on this team. Like, I don't want to send them somewhere. And so, uh, I would probably say, I would probably say, a future second or third or some sort of um, combination thereabouts. Like, uh, you know, if, if, if he agrees to the contract and it sounds good and it's not through the nose, I'd be okay with a future second. So if Philly called you Friday morning and said, 34th pick for A.J. Brown, he's yours, you don't do it? Nope. Okay. Nope. Cortland Sutton, is he more of a fourth round guy, future fourth, future third? Yeah, I would say it might be a future third, but somewhere in that ballpark. All right, C.D. Lamb's holding out. Any chance Jerry Jones thinks about trading him? Nope, nope. They will pay him. He talked, uh, I think it was Stephen Jones talked about today, or Jerry Jones, whoever, um, was talking to reporters, and you know they asked about their inactivity, and he said, well, we need to pay you know X, Y, and Z, and, and C.D. Lamb was one of those guys. I don't think he's going anywhere. All right, another guy. Um, Rick Spielman said a pipe dream offer from Minnesota to New England to move up to three could include Jefferson or Darasaw. Any shot Justin Jefferson is out there for the taking as part of a deal for three. Do I think it's possible? Um, yes. I don't think the chances are great, but you know, they do have Jordan Addison who's, you know, ready. He's basically a number one and you could see. Kevin O'Connell, depending on the, the the guy they want at three, um, how high the ceiling is, and let's just say it's Drake May. Um, I could I could see them being okay with. I mean, and and you know they wouldn't have to pay Justin Jefferson, um, you know what he's worth. The Patriots would have to do it. Um, ch- changing that um, for a franchise quarterback. With not much on the roster, yeah, I think I, I could see that being potentially offered. T. Higgins said he anticipates playing for the Cincinnati Bengals this year. Does it matter what T. Higgins anticipates? Um, a little bit because I think he's right. This is again, this is Mike Brown that we're talking about, and he's he's not going to give in. He's not going to really look to the future. Um, he's. Mike Brown does not, you know, if T Higgins threatens and I think he, he asked for a trade, Mike Brown does not react well to that stuff. I fully expect T Higgins to play the year out for the Bengals. One more before we get to the process of selecting a quarterback. Let's do another percentage here with you. What percentage would you put right now on the Patriots trading for a veteran wide receiver? Ooh, good question. A percentage. Okay. I, like, of course, it, it's this is before knowing how high they draft a receiver in this yes. in this draft. Yes, um, it would be different. Like say say they trade down and they pick Roma Dunze at like eleven or something yeah. like that. Like obviously that changes things, right? But let's just go um, in a vacuum. The chances of the Patriots trading for a number one wide receiver, I would say. I love it. 52% (laughs) shot. All right. So we'll see what happens. Greg, meanwhile, wrote a great column over the weekend. Y'all should check it out. Uh, He spoke to a guy who's worn many, many hats in the NFL. Uh, Coach, OC, front office, has worked for multiple teams that have been responsible for drafting quarterbacks. It was some really good stuff from Greg. And I would say there's, you know, there's more than just a beer goggles comment. I know the beer goggles comment has been thrown out there roughly 55 times in the last two days, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot more to that column than just that one, uh, that one quote, which was a great quote. All right. So let's start here, Greg. The difference between the interview process at the combine, at the visits and the zooms, because I think a lot of people say, oh, they already talked to this guy. It, what's the difference between the visit interviews that, Michael Penix is going through today the zoom interviews that he might you know have to do after this or even before this in the combine I mean basically it's anything before 
anything before 30 visits or uh, like say individual workouts, um, you know, late in the draft process to me, none of that stuff really matters. Like, you know, all, all the nonsense about like, well, the Patriots met with this guy at the combine or the Patriots met with this guy at the senior bowl, at least when you're talking about picking a franchise quarterback and we're not talking about, you know, drafting a linebacker in the second round, or even like looking for a backup QB who might have some upside, like that's different. We're talking about picking a potential franchise quarterback for your team. Yeah. To me, if you don't have some sort of, and it, it doesn't matter whether it's a 30 visit or it's an on-site visit or whatever, you need at least one like very lengthy four, six, eight hour day with these guys to, um, to make some sort of a, assessment. So anything else, any all-star game, any, even their pro day, um, the combine, any of that stuff, all that stuff is meaningless when it comes to picking a franchise quarterback. If somebody failed during this visiting process, would we even hear about it? No, no, no. Um, you know, that's why like, uh, you know, cause I'll get questions from people be like, how did the, how did so-and-so's visit go? Like, I mean, have you ever in the history of the NFL heard something like, Oh yeah. That guy's visit with so-and-so went terrible. He's awful. He's <laughs> off their board. Like it just, it doesn't happen. I mean, you are, you have to remember like, you know, the player and the agent are also somewhat doing you a favor. I mean, they're taking a block of their time yeah. out to travel over and all this stuff. So the last thing you want to do, if you're any sort of franchise with self-respect is to trash some guy on the way out the door after he just uh, made that investment um, in you. I know it's a two way street, but um, yeah, th those are sort of my feelings on that. Yeah. Relationships matter. And if you do that and you, you piss the agent off now, you might have an issue with the next guy, right? So you yep. also have to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. I thought some of the comments from this source in your story were some of the best stuff. And that's about the coaching staff in the front office. Greg, how crucial is it? that the staff in the front office can actually come to a consensus, can agree on the quarterback that they pick. Yeah, it's it's everything, Nick. And what, what surprised me the most probably, you know, doing this story was about, and I guess it shouldn't be all that surprising in hindsight and sort of, you know, the way some of these teams do business. But there, there are some teams, and he used uh, – this source used examples of uh, – and I'm trying to find it. Yeah, Kenny Pickett, um, Malik Willis, just off the top of my head. Yeah, I remember correctly. Mitch, Mitch Trubisky was probably the biggest one. Basically, yeah. this source said the Bears coaches didn't want Mitch Trubisky. Yep. Um, Malik Willis, the coaches in Tennessee didn't want Malik Willis. Kenny Pickett in, in Pittsburgh. Trey Lance, you know, he basically like – you know, those are – at least when you're talking about Trubisky and Trey Lance, you're talking about two of the biggest whiffs in recent NFL history in drafting a quarterback um, high up. And, um, you know, we all, I think we all knew like Malik Mill Willis was way overdrafted um, by the Titans. Certainly uh, an intriguing prospect, but somebody who needed a lot of work. And I think he was drafted in the middle of the first round, something like that. But um, I think, you know, if, and this is where I think Nick, and we've talked about this. This is where, and I know there are some Patriots fans who are frustrated by Elliot Wolf and the coaching staff and the quote unquote Packer way and stuff like that. But and and just just that Alex Van Pelt's the offensive coordinator and not uh, tight pants Shanahan <laughs> offspring du jour. Um, these guys are in alignment, like you know, between Elliot Wolf and Alonzo Highsmith and Alex Van Pelt and Ben McAdoo, you were talking about four guys who have a very long history together uh, of doing a bunch of different things with the Packers. Um, they've each gone on to do other things, so they're bringing some insight that way. But, like, I, I think the chances are absolutely, unless the only possibility for me is if Gerard Mayo, through his uh, ability to, let's say, manipulate Robert Kraft, um, if Gerard Mayo, because I don't know, maybe he's aligned with Matt Groh or Cam Williams or I don't know, maybe there's, and again, I don't envision this, but 
the only potential screw up I see for the Patriots is if Gerard Mayo is listening to somebody who says you need to take X and Mayo manipulates Kraft to basically force Elliot Wolf to do that. Outside of that, I think the 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 uh, the odds are extremely low that Elliot Wolf, Alonzo Highsmith, Ben McAdoo, and and Alex Van Pelt that they're all not going to be in lockstep on who the next quarterback is. They are going to have a plan. They will have sat down and and said, "All right, with each of these quarterbacks, all right, what's the plan for this guy? How are we going to run the offense with this guy? Is that optimal for this offense? Is it optimal for you?" What about, and that's more of a Jaden Daniels thing. What about Drake May? How far away is he? How uh, how coachable do you think he is? Is he going to be screwed up if we put him in there? Can he run your offense? Um, is it better with which quarterback? And you go through each of these quarterbacks, and they're going to do that. And I think at the end of the day, to me, there's little question that the four of them, at the very least, Wolf, Highsmith, Van Pelt, and McAdoo, they're all going to be in lockstep on exactly – who they want, what the plan is. And to me, that's the biggest thing in this game, and it gives the Patriots a chance. Greg has a lot of info in his head. So before we get tweets thrown at us and, and hate mail via email or whatever. What I do now. Uh, Malik Willis was 86th in the draft. He was picked in the third round. So, Oh, he was? Yeah, so before yeah. people lose so, their minds. And we, sorry. We're about, just, we, we just want to be accountable on the podcast. So <laughs> Willis went 86. All right, I got a couple more questions for Greg before he bounces to go to the Bruins game. Uh, this episode brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. Also, check them out over at BSJ. Fifty bucks for the year for the fine work the gentlemen do over there. Uh, the Patriots. Another part of this, Greg, that I found your column that I found very fascinating was when does the circle of trust, so to speak, start to whittle down? And you got to feel like we're almost at that moment, right? Are, are we are we close to that day where, okay, everybody else out of the room and, and now it's for the folks who are going to handle this pick, it's time for us to, to come to some decisions? Yeah, I think um, I think it's going to be very soon, um, you know, after the 30 visits. Now, you know, there's still a chance that, say, Elliot Wolf sends Alonzo Highsmith or Ben McAdoo or Alex Van Pelt, maybe all three of them, off to do visits, maybe, you know, recheck in with May and Daniels and J.J. McCarthy and Penix. And, like, you know, I, I think I, I think the, you know, the small working group, to me, will probably at the least meet this weekend and so that's what pe what people need to understand about this is like you know from what i've heard the patriots have been extremely inclusive in the process a, a complete departure from belichick where there's been a lot of full staff viewings of film giving opinions on this guy and all that stuff um there's been a lot of that going on um but i think at some point and you know i would anticipate the small working group being elliot wolf Alonzo Highsmith, Mayo, and possibly the Crafts at some point. My question is, I don't is Gro going to be in that group? He could. The Crafts could say, I want him in there in that. But I think that's the small working group where a lot of people know people's feelings on certain things and they know the way their board is stacked right now. But they'll go go behind closed doors and that group will come to a consensus and move things ever so slightly and do a horizontal stack which is now you're comparing, um, say, at 34. At 34, if um, Suma Matias on the board or uh, A.D. Mitchell is yeah. on the board, who who are we taking in this circumstance? So then you go through through that process, and I think that I think that small working group is going to start working very soon. Last one for you. Mentioned the beer goggles comment. And the point from the source was there's not going to be five or six quarterbacks coming out of this draft, okay, that, that end up being like good NFL starters. He says, you know, two, right? He says at least, you know, maybe two, maybe outside shot of three. I know we got your quarterback rankings earlier, Greg, but of course we got to play, you know, the potential game and all of that. If Greg Bedard yep. had to lay his money down on the table right now, which two QBs does he think does he think have the best chance of working out at the NFL level? Just um, for the Patriots or team du jour? 
Team du jour. Okay, so um, I think for sure Caleb Caleb, Caleb Williams. Okay, I, mean, I think I think he's going to be a star. Um, this is a really good question. Um, I'm going to go. It's close between Daniels and May for me. Um, and there's a lot of like a lot a, a lot about Daniels. Um, I'm going to say may, I, I just like, I like his tools and makeup and all that stuff, the background with the family and all that stuff. Like I, those guys like really like hit a lot. Now I will say this, Nick, you know, sort of a alternative angle to me. Um, the question that I would have, and we can both answer it, um, which, which two quarterbacks do I think the Patriots view as having a chance to be a franchise quarterback for them. Mm. You know, say they get down to it and they're like, out of these five, six guys, these are really the only two that we envision. Yeah. To me, it's May and Penix. And Penix in a Ooh. trade down. That that they would be like, either we're getting May or we're trading back and we're taking Penix and we're okay with that. Interesting. So not McCarthy. I thought you were going to say May and McCarthy, no. but May and Penix. Well, maybe that's why Penix came in so late, folks. All right, he's Greg. I'm Nick. He's going to a Bruins game. I'm going to my living room. Until later this week, uh, it's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattle.